I am an alien. No, for real, I'm, I'm an alien. So many differences to overcome. We have food you can't really eat. We have clothing you can't really wear for more than an hour, as you can say from an interesting outfit. <laughs> and we have letters that your throat is not even structured to pronounce, like <sighs> or k, k, k. See? Well, according to the US law, an alien is an individual who is not a U.S. citizen or a U.S. national. Well, and since I'm from Iran, I also count as an alien. I volunteer at the Space Visualization Lab of the Adler Planetarium. And it's kind of a nice place for an alien to be, because you're surrounded with all these space images, you know, some nice moon rock and space rock, in a place that advocates for exploring the universe and is not obsessed with national boundaries. Well, that things happen to you sometimes as when you're an alien. You just like click things and they <laughs> suddenly turn into other things. You're like, what is like my superpowers? I didn't know I have those. Um, I'm gonna go on and talk to you about the planetarium, how it's different from other places. You know, when you wanna find your way, you know, when you wanna know where you are, you use a map, like a normal map, like this one. I am gonna wait for the map to appear. <laughs> and using this map, you know where you are. You know, like, this is where I'm standing on Earth, right? But in the planetarium, we use a different kind of map. That is the map that we use in the planetarium. Voila. <laughs> that was my power of, look, I just look and then it goes next. It's as if they're trying to use science to tell you that we're all standing at the same point on Earth, in the same space. And this is something very interesting when you think about it. So I've spent the last year learning and studying science communication at the planetarium. And I think the most important thing that I've learned is that science communication can bring people closer together. I have this Japanese friend from my PhD program, and he's actually here, sitting with us today. Sometimes we sit together, we have some nice green tea, he opens his Japanese book of history and reads to me stories of the Edo era, of the samurai and the shogun and their bravery. But he reads them in Japanese. And even though I don't understand his words, in my heart, I feel them, and I connect to them. And when I do, I open my Persian book of poetry and read to him a verse of Rumi. He nods and lets me know that in his heart, he also understands what I'm talking about. Nah, that's just ridiculous. We both speak English. I would, <laughs> I, I would seriously have no idea what he would be saying if he would be starting speaking Japanese. That's the same problem when science and society talk to each other. Science and society are completely two different languages, and we need a mutual language to translate them to each other. That mutual language, that mutual point of reference, could be basically a movie we have both watched. It could be an example we both know. It could be an analogy, just anything that we could relate to. You know, it might be hard for people to relate to the language of jargon, hypotheses, numbers, theories, but it's easier for us to connect to something that we already experience. Maybe that's an example that we already had in our life or an experience or an emotion. So when a scientist tells you about their journey, you could connect to their motivation, their fear, the hardness of the journey, the, all the problems they have experienced. But it would probably be harder if someone would say, you know what? Black holes eat up everything around them. I eat food. I could totally relate to black holes. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think that's a thing. And as an alien, you soon realize that if you don't have that mutual language, you will be having a really hard time making sense of the world and an even harder time 
connecting and sharing your ideas with the world. One way that you could share your ideas is through stories, from real stories of scientists and inventors coming up with all these fascinating things to fake mythological explanation of natural phenomena. For example, did you know that rainbows are actually unicorn burp? Yeah, science. Growing up, I inherited a lot of my brother's book interests. My favorite ones were Greek mythology. There were these ridiculous, weird stories of these gods and goddesses who fell in love and were revengeful and were happy and sad and for whatever reason would turn people into deers and bears and spiders and stuff. And they were kind of fun to read. Years later, in high school, my friend Fahime told me about her new interests astronomy and stargazing. She taught me all these different constellations and told me about the stories behind them. And I was really surprised because these stories were the same Greek mythology that I was reading while growing up. And suddenly knowing these stories, this foreign weird science of astronomy was not that strange and unrelatable anymore. My favorite story is of the constellation, the Jaja, the Swan, or Cygnus. This Greek mythology follows the adventure of Zeus, the god of all the gods, who falls in love with Leda, the super hot wife of a Spartan king. And for whatever reason, he decides to turn himself into a swan to seduce Leda successfully. And unless that swan has the face of George Clooney, I don't really know how that story could be realistic. I just don't know. In some versions of the story, Leda later lays two eggs, giving birth to her own children with Zeus and the children of the Spartan king. Now, what is really fascinating about this constellation, apart from the weird story that I just told you about, I'm trying to forget that, it's very weird, <laughs> is what hides in this constellation. Somewhere deep in the neck of Zeus, there is a black hole. Just think about it. Zeus is just like flying by, and then he finds this super tiny, super heavy black hole, and he's like, I, I could eat that. Uh-uh, he can't, can't eat that. He tries, and it just like gets stuck somewhere in his throat, and he can't swallow it, and there there is, a black hole in his throat. Now, knowing this weird story, and being able to see that constellation, and know that somewhere there, there is a black hole, that was my first hookup experience with astronomy, and man, I never broke up with it. Because that was pretty damn good science storytelling. You don't always have to come up with good stories to help people relate to science. Sometimes you could draw upon things that people already know about through analogies. So what's the big deal about this super tiny, super heavy black hole that eats up everything around it? Well, that's closely related to Einstein's theory of general relativity, that every object produces a curve in space-time. I want you to imagine a Todd blanket. If you put a ping pong ball, what happens? It causes a little curve in the blanket, right? Now, if you put in that blanket a bowling ball, the curve becomes deeper, right? And if you put some marbles around it, it goes whoop, whoop, whoop around it until it falls into it. If you think about the context of space and the texture of space as a blanket, it produces the same kind of curves when you have an object in it. And those objects affect the objects around it in the same way as well. And that's the basic of the theory of relativity, the general theory of relativity. Okay. Now, Let's remove that bowling ball and replace it with a dot. If you squeeze in that dot, not just the mass of one sun, but the mass of 15 suns, then you have a black hole like the one in the neck of the swan called Cygnus X1. This black hole causes a curve and a gravity so deep and so strong that nothing that comes close enough to it could get away from it, not even light. 
How close is that? That's 40 kilometer. It's like a half an hour drive from the black hole. It's pretty scary if you think about it. And it's human nature to be scared of the unknown. Unknown situations, unknown creatures, or unknown numbers. Growing up, I was scared of three things. Sharks, piranhas, yeah, and black holes. My parents used to collect this German science magazine. It was called the PM. And I remember on one of the issues, I see this picture. By the way, that's actually that issue that I'm talking about. And I asked my mom, I'm like, mom, what, what does it say on this? She said, oh, it's about this black hole that it's near us. But don't worry, it's fine. It's like really far away. I can't remember much. But I remember I was scared out of my mind. What? There's a black hole and it's coming towards us and it's gonna just eat us all up and we're all gonna die? I'm too young for this, this can't happen to me. It was pretty traumatic. But when you don't know what numbers look like, especially when they're in scales too big or too small, you start making up things that might or might not be true. My analogies might not make that much sense if I don't know what are the numbers that are used in them. What are these numbers in relation to each other? What are the contexts in which the numbers are used? So numbers matter a lot. And we have to make them imaginable and tangible. So, should we be scared of Cygnus X1, the black hole in the neck of the swan? No. Cygnus X1 is 6,070 light years away. That means if that black hole, even if it's coming towards us, which is not, with the speed of light, which is not, it will take it as long as it took for human civilization to get to where we are right now. That's a long time. Those same ancient civilizations use stories to make sense of the universe. What are constellations but just some stars scattered in the sky? But they gave them life. They gave them emotions that they could understand. They turned them into lovers, siblings, parents, and sometimes all of them all at once. Greek <laughs> mythology. <laughs> but we need stories to make sense of the uncertainty of the universe. Up until today, even though we know that Cygnus is not a weirdo, creepy swan, we still could enjoy a ridiculous soap opera story about it. Getting through the jargon, the hard to understand scientific terminology, the complicated explanations have always been a problem for scientists when they try to explain their work. They have to make themselves understandable and relatable in order to build relationships. What makes communication work is a mutual ground. For science to talk to the society, they need mutual grounds like analogies and examples and stories and sometimes just really bad drawings to build a visual mutual ground. <laughs> but we're using those shared experiences <coughs> to understand something more important. That as human beings, with all of our differences, we share a greater mutual ground. The same sun that shines on us every day, and the same night sky with its constellations that puts us to sleep. The laws of physics are human beings mutual ground. And understanding that help us change our view from being obsessed over thinking that we're here, aliens to each other, to realize that we're all here together. Thank you. <laughs>